Have you streamed the video today? I certainly have, and that's not good for the environment. But I store a lot of data in the cloud instead of printing it out, so that should reduce my environmental footprint, or does it? Just how green is our digital lifestyle? Today on Shift. Did you know that every Google search consumes electricity, 0.3 watt hours to be precise? That's what a 60 watt light bulb consumes in 18 seconds. It may not sound like much, but when you consider that Google processes 3.5 billion search requests every day, it adds up. So should we do without Google? I can't imagine it, to be honest, even though it would save energy. The internet is too much a part of my life. Offline alternatives do exist, of course like going to an actual store instead of ordering online, or using a good old-fashioned map instead of a sad map. Can we make the digital revolution more sustainable? We spoke with environmental economist Stefan Lange. In his book Smart Green World, he tries to answer the question. So, what really is better for the environment? Renting a DVD or streaming a movie. Generally speaking, watching a DVD consumes less electricity because transmitting data from the cloud uses lots of energy. But if you drive to the video store, that increases the environmental burden. If you drive more than 20 kilometers, streaming is better. Less than that, a DVD is better. If you walk to pick it up, a DVD is always better. File cabinet or the cloud? The rule of thumb here is that it's best to print less and save paper. If we're only talking about files and documents, the cloud is greener. A paperless office is the way to go. Flea market or eBay. Purchasing things at a flea market is more environmentally friendly. Online shopping consumes electricity, and then there's transportation and packaging too, both of which result in significant CO2 emissions. Of all the things you can do online, eBay is sensible, since it's a second-hand online market. Buying used is better than buying new on Amazon. Paper book or e-reader? Here it depends on your own habits. The more books you read on the e-reader instead of in a printed version, the greater the environmental benefit. The tipping point comes between 30 and 50 books. That's when an e-reader becomes greener than paper. Shopping mall or online shopping? A brick and mortar store is still more environmentally friendly. Delivering individual purchases to your doorstep isn't energy efficient. If it were working at full capacity, online shopping could be more environmentally friendly. Ironically, though, when you shop online, you're barraged with advertising, which makes you consume even more. Which is very easy to do. Streaming, storing files in a cloud, shopping online, it all takes just a few clicks. But the fact is, even an energy-efficient process, if you repeat it often enough, ends up increasing energy consumption. So digital isn't automatically green. Digitalization isn't going to increase sustainability automatically. We need to transform society and the economy to make it sustainable and then see what positive role digitalization can play in that. Digitalization doesn't always make things more environmentally friendly. So it's worth thinking about which solutions are more beneficial. Take sharing platforms, for example. The sharing economy is booming. Nowadays, we can share cars, bicycle, apartments, you name it. An app called Olio, for instance, lets you share food that would otherwise be thrown away. Anyone can use it. Private individuals, supermarkets and restaurants. It's a clever use of mobile technology. What are your thoughts on this, Steffen Lange? The sharing economy is a great idea. Digitalization has been good for some things, food sharing, couch surfing. But it's important to realize that there are also some negative examples. There have been several studies on car sharing, and they've concluded that people tend to use car sharing instead of walking or taking the subway. So in reality, it's like a substitute for buying a car. So car sharing may actually put more cars on the street and it doesn't seem to affect the number of new cars purchased. And what about our buying habits when it comes to smartphones? I'm already on my 10th, which does make me feel a little ashamed. 
and I'm just one of many people who always want the latest and best. Nearly 7 billion smartphones were manufactured between 2007 and 2017 at a high cost for the environment. First, there are the raw materials. Smartphones use rare earths and precious metals, from cobalt in the battery to indium in the touchscreen. They have to be mined and chemically processed, all of which is environmentally damaging. Then there's e-waste. Companies invest heavily in advertising to get us to buy the latest devices. As a result, many smartphones are replaced even though they still work. That's also true for computers, TVs and kitchen appliances. That can hardly be considered green. Then there's energy consumption. The more complex the device, the more energy goes into making it. And even surfing uses much more energy than you might think. They're the factories of the digital age. Huge data centers store vast amounts of data so that users can access it whenever they want, whether it's streaming a film, using a search engine, or storing data in the cloud. Transferring this data consumes huge amounts of energy. If the internet were a country, it would be the world's fifth or sixth biggest energy consumer. Cryptocurrency mining is especially energy intensive. Miners who want to earn bitcoins donate their computing power to keep the network up and running. That power helps to calculate complex mathematical equations to verify financial transactions. Huge server farms are being built to mine bitcoin. It's estimated that each transaction consumes as much energy as a refrigerator freezer uses in an entire year. Video streaming is also an energy hog. It already accounts for 60% of data traffic and energy consumption, and that's set to rise. In Germany, data centers are currently increasing their power consumption by 6% a year. Worldwide, that figure is 10%. Unless we generate this energy from renewable resources, we're all contributing to climate change. Around the world, the number of Internet users continues to increase. Last year, it rose by 9%. What can I do to save energy? The Internet of Things, or IoT for short, could help. The IoT is a system that networks smart devices. A washing machine, say, would then only run when it gets enough power from your rooftop solar installation. Will the IoT help or hurt the environment? Let's take a look. Heating and cooling a building takes a lot of energy, as do lights. It's estimated that half that energy is wasted. Intelligent IoT systems measure energy use with smart sensors and send the data to the cloud. There it's analysed to see how energy might be saved. As the Internet of Things continues to grow, it will transmit ever more data. And that too consumes energy. Not all of this data deluge is useful to the cloud or data centre. Intelligent gateways can help edit that data flow to pass on only what's relevant, which helps save energy. These smart windows generate electricity. Built-in solar cells transform light into power, which you can even use to charge your smartphone. And smart sensors in the windows respond to environmental influences in order to help keep indoor temperatures pleasant while saving energy. So not even experts are sure whether the Internet of Things will be an environmental boon. It will depend on two things, how much energy the devices consume and how much data they transmit. Another new technology that could benefit the environment is artificial intelligence. Could AI help save endangered species and maybe help save our forests? At the EarthLab Forum hosted by Microsoft Berlin, some AI experts and environmental pioneers asked whether it can boost sustainability and arrived at some fascinating results. AI can process huge amounts of data in a short time. That allows us to tackle projects that would otherwise be impossible. AI itself cannot save our planet. However, I can tell you that without AI, we will not get there. We cannot manage what we don't measure. So we need to start by measuring Earth resources so that we can little by little improve how we monitor, model, and ultimately manage Earth resources. For example, the Wild Me project identifies and tracks wildlife populations. 
photographs of animals are uploaded onto an open source platform by researchers and private citizens. An AI system identifies each animal by its markings and other features and records the location and time the image was captured. That allows scientists to monitor migration patterns, for example, and lets users trace the movements of an animal they photographed on their last holiday. The Sylvia Terra startup wants to use AI to improve forest management in the United States. The software assesses forests using satellite imagery recording species of the trees, their height, and the density of the forest. This information allows for more efficient forest management, boosts biodiversity, and helps ensure the water supply. Right now, uh, scientists that are focused on conservation and are spending thousands of hours just sifting through images. By using artificial intelligence, you save the time what it used to take 100 days you can take only a couple of hours. And that time is now spent back in actual research instead of sifting through images. Most AI systems that seek to protect the environment are still in development. How effective they'll be remains to be seen. Processing all that data takes a lot of energy. For a project to be worthwhile, it will have to be effective enough to offset that energy consumption. Here's one thing you can do. Use a search engine that plants trees. Indirectly, of course. Ecosia says they invest 80% of their ad revenue in reforestation and conservation project. For every 45 searches, a tree is planted. Ecosia is a search engine mask, and the results are powered by Bing. And how about you? Could you imagine only going online when you really need to? watching a film on DVD rather than streaming it, and using your smartphone until it actually gives up the ghost? Could changing our digital lifestyle help save the planet, or are changes like this just a drop in the bucket compared to what's truly needed? Tell us what you think on Facebook or on DW.com. Goodbye and see you soon.